Hello, Internet. I'm Robert Evans, and this is once again Behind the Bastards, the show where we tell you everything you don't know about the very worst people in all of history. And today we have a very special episode for all of you. It's another episode on Alex Jones, the epilogue of Alex Jones, you could call it. And uh, my guests today are the guys from Knowledge Fight, Dan and Jordan. How are y'all doing today? Hey. We're doing great. Thanks for having us. Yeah. I'm Jordan. <laughs> uh, in case our listeners don't know, Dan knows a lot about Alex Jones. Jordan does not know much about Alex Jones, but in reality, you both know an enormous amount about Alex Jones because you've recorded hundreds of podcast episodes about yeah. him. <laughs> yeah. To to my everlasting regret, I started doing this podcast because I wanted to hang out with my friend, and now I know too much about this man. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm a negative influence. Y'all's podcast, Knowledge Fight. Listeners, you can go to knowledgefight.com if you want to hear more about Alex Jones. They break down his episodes. You guys are both doing the modern stuff, and you go like back to 2008, nine episodes. Y'all's podcast has become one of my favorite. I, I kind of learned about it as I was finishing up the first Alex Jones podcast, but I listen to you guys two or three times a week. Uh, oh, I'm just well, trying to get you. caught up. I love your stuff. So I'm thank really you for glad you enjoy it. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, we, uh, we absolutely appreciate your work as well. Ah, well. Uh, let's, uh, let's get into this. Let's talk a little bit about Alex Jones. Sure. Uh, I'd like to open this video, this, or I'd like to open this episode with a special video I found of Alex Jones, uh, on Inauguration Day, outrageously Ooh. drunk and ranting oh, about yeah. some sort of bizarre future space program. Have you guys seen this one? I, 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 I have, uh, horrific memories of, uh, <laughs> Inauguration yeah. Night, Election Night, that whole season was a pretty bad time uh, yeah. <laughs> for the, watching Alex Jones. <laughs> I forget when I came across this one, but it's pretty remarkable. I, I like it because it showcases Alex Jones as drunk as I think he's ever been. But that may be optimistic on my part. <laughs> I would say so. He's he's reached some dazzling heights of intoxication. There are four ways to learn. Uh, one of which is race memory, I believe. That's a great drunk he's quote been of his. Very very drunk before. Yeah yeah yeah. None none of those four ways to learn, by the way, that he references were. Uh, Reading, research, <laughs> any kind of uh, oh. physical uh, look. Uh, libraries are where he goes to uh, uh, shit. Basically, he's yeah. not. He's not there for the books. They have free coffee. <laughs> All right, I'm going to play this video just to warm up the waters for our listeners here. Here's drunk Alex Jones. This will be created. It'll launch a space program that sends humanity into space. It'll launch a program. Well, that's the big difference. The new Atlantis will be created. It'll launch a space program that sends humanity into space. It'll launch a program that puts humanity on the map forever in the galaxy. It'll launch a program when our ancestors a thousand years from now are on hundreds and hundreds of star systems and galaxies. They'll look back and say, these are the people that had the vision that they did it all. It won't be Japan. It won't be China. It won't be Russia. It won't be Latin America. It'll be America. <laughs> Uh, is it Latin America still America? No, <laughs> no, no, no. It's wrong America. It's in the, name. the wrong America. <laughs> I do Alex love, it, it seems like in Alex Jones's conception of the world, Canada just kind of gets a free ride onto the space train. Like, sure. <laughs> we're just, we're just lumping ah, them in. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're white. <laughs> That's seems, Alex's worldview. Seems like a joke, but that is where <laughs> yeah, his no. head is at. Yeah. So that is kind of, uh, yeah, what, my favorite part of that, if I remember that uh, night correctly, that was uh, he's stumbling around D.C., and a little bit after that, uh, in the video, he ends up running into a bunch of fans, and he almost catatonically shakes hands with people. Like, people <laughs> keep coming up to him, like, Alex Jones is like, hey, how's it going? But he's almost unconscious when he's talking to these people. It's just, it's a very weird dynamic he seems to have with people, but... I, I don't think anybody hates Alex Jones listeners more than Alex Jones. He, seems... he despises his uh, his fans so much. That actually gets us on to sort of what we'll be talking about for a big chunk of this episode, which is the, the contempt that he seems to have for the people who have given him everything that he has. Dear God. <laughs> it's uh, it's really quite remarkable. I mean, w when we last talked about Alex Jones on my show, he'd just been kicked off of Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, pretty much everything. Uh, mm -hmm. Our episode three-parter ended with him in a donkey mask shouting about the, the <laughs> $1.3 billion Islamist strain and Satanism waiting at the border of the country. <laughs> Yeah, that was, that, was, yeah. Uh, that was a banner night for him. They I were, remember that. They were there, and then suddenly they weren't very quickly. It yeah. was a surprise. Yeah, yeah they really. Uh, that was that was an impressive movement of 1.3 billion people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he has trouble with numbers. Is one of the <laughs> themes you're going to find if you ever look too deeply into Alex. Doesn't understand math, uh, language, or numbers. Those no. are 
fundamental problems. Great at shouting, though. Really. Absolutely. <laughs> if there's one thing I can look up to the man for, uh, as a shouter myself, he can really shout the shit out of things. Yeah. yeah. One of the best. And uh, that day, the day that I finished writing the, the script, I think, InfoWars made an announcement that they were launching uh, InfoWars Yes, which is uh, sure. <laughs> Alex framed as an incredible opportunity for his listeners incredible and his viewers. Yeah. Uh, uh, he's selling you uh, economic freedom. Yeah. I don't know why. What, I don't, I, you don't want to be a small business owner? I don't Come know why. On, I don't American know, dream. Why are you scoffing at this? It's a... Uh, it's a proven system. <laughs> well, yeah, InfoWars, yes, since our listeners probably don't pay much attention to Alex Jones, is essentially he's he's getting rid of InfoWars Life, it seems, his supplement line, and replacing it, it with another line of supplements sold by a company named Jeunesse. Uh, mm -hmm. n not the Jeunesse that, that Keith Raniere, the guy who started that Nexium cult that branded women did, but a different spelling of essentially right, right. the same pronunciation. <laughs> but easy, they, easy mistake to make. With but, the yeah. same result at the end of the day. Yeah, they're both MLMs. They're, they're both <laughs> yeah. multi-level marketing companies. Multi-level marketing company. He's going to get branded at the end of it. I'll tell you that right now. Yep. <laughs> Well, I looked into Jeunesse a little bit because, uh, you know, Alex claimed that, number one, their supplements were better than the supplements he'd been selling, which is uh, pretty interesting for Alex to do. It's a strange business plan for him to come out and insult his own line in favor of this new line that he's bringing in if he expects to ever sell his old line ever again. That, oh, yeah. that's, that struck me as very strange. And I, I guess we'll get to that in a little bit, but it does seem like this is almost the end game of InfoWars. Maybe that's wishful thinking on my part, but uh, it looks like he's trying to basically cash in on the audience that he has as fast as he can, because Jeunesse is not a nice company. Um, I, I did a little bit of digging into them. You did some on your show, too, and it definitely shows that bit. the majority of people, like with every MLM, don't make any money or lose money on the business. I did go to their website because I wanted to know how Jeunesse presents themselves. Their mission statement is, the Jeunesse family creates positive impact in the world by helping people look and feel young while empowering each other to unleash our potential, which is about as vague as you're going to find on anything. Uh, doesn't I am sold, sir. <laughs> you want to be you want to unleash your potential to feel Hell young? Yeah. yeah. Love it. I've always I've always wondered why I haven't been unleashing my potential and it turns out Jeunesse has a way to go about it. Yeah. I assume I'm going to get branded in a sex cult here shortly, right? That and you're going to get a microbiotic skin mask. That now that <laughs> sounds that's a double whammy of fun. It's all that's been holding you back. <laughs> turns out <laughs> well, and when you're branding yourself, you really want the uh, the patented Jeunesse stem cell uh, skin rejuvenation uh, 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 tonic, yeah, which is actually a thing that they sell. <laughs> yeah. um, In this case, actually, branding yourself kind of works both ways. There's a double meaning. Yeah, it you does. Know, you gotta, you gotta. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we will talk about the branding a little bit because Jones made some really interesting choices and in had a brand Infowars, yes, but I want to stay on Jeunesse for just a little bit longer. Oops. So I looked into the company's bio and it says that it began in the, uh, the hearts and minds of visionaries Randy Ray and <laughs> Wendy Lewis, having achieved tremendous success in other enterprises. Uh, basically, they created Jeunesse in 2009 on September 9th, 2009 at 9 p.m. because the number nine represents longevity for reasons that are unclear to me. Uh, We're getting into supreme mathematics here. It, it does seem talk like... Talk to the Wu-Tang Clan about this. <laughs> I'm not a numerologer, but it does seem that any number higher than nine would better represent longevity than the number nine. I, I don't know. It's the largest single-digit number. That makes perfect sense. Oh, Let's okay, move on. okay, Let's okay. Let's move on, Solid. write it down on the board. Let's keep on going. <laughs> so Mr. Ray and Miss Lewis, because, you know, they claim to have achieved tremendous success in other enterprises. So I looked into what those other enterprises were, <laughs> and they, they got their start with Fuel Freedom International, which was a, an yeah. MLM that sold pills you put in your car's gas tank to give it better mileage. Wait, hold on. <laughs> yeah. Say that one more time. They started Wait, what? Fuel Freedom International, an MLM that sells pills that you put in your car to give it better gas mileage. <laughs> Look, you take aspirin, your car needs aspirin, everybody knows it makes yeah. perfect sense. What, else, what are you going to yeah. do if you're not drugging your car? Exactly. <laughs> you're just leaving money on the table with a sober car. Exactly. No one's drug testing your car. Um, your honor, my car was drunk. Come on. <laughs> it was drunk so it would drive further. <laughs> 
Uh, so the claim that Fuel Freedom made was that the their car pill technology was invented by NASA in the 1970s, although there's zero evidence for this claim. There's also zero evidence that the magical car pills ever worked, and people did try to study that. So again, it seems like they were just selling nonsense magic for your gas tank. Now, in 2009, Mr. Ray and Miss Lewis got together with a Beverly Hills doctor to make an anti-aging face cream made out of stem cells and have since then cashed in very successfully on people's fears of getting old. So that seems that to be... That was the weirdest sequel to Beverly Hills Cop, <laughs> the Beverly Hills Doctor. Beverly that was Hills a weird Stem franchise. Cell Doctor. <laughs> You know, you give John Reinhold his own franchise, and you know you're going to run into trouble. You know, it says a lot about you that you picked Beverly Hills Cop as the Beverly Hills movie to call this a sequel to, and not Beverly Hills Ninja, the Chris Farley classic. Uh, do you mean the greatest movie ever made? <laughs> yes, Come on, now. I was really... going to go with Troop Beverly Hills. <laughs> <laughs> Shows where my mind is at. <laughs> So Janessa's business did grow wildly over the mid aughts uh, and made hundreds of millions of dollars. Like uh, in 2013 or 14, they were showing like a 400, 500 percent growth rate year over year. But it seems to have tapered off recently, in part due to the fact that they are super shady. So I did some reading within the MLM community to, just to try to see how this company was looked at by people who are into multi level marketing, and I found oh, a site yeah. called Behind MLM. And they, uh, one of the things they note is that Jeunesse has a history of, quote, cutting secret backroom deals with high-profile affiliates, which means that they basically go after people with big audiences and pay them you thousands bet. of dollars in order to get access to their audience, which seems to be exactly what's going on with Alex Jones right now. It's the Scientology uh, business model, I believe. Yeah, find someone famous and then their fans will pay you money. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So behind MLM, talks about one other personality that Jeunesse sort of poached from a different MLM, and they paid him $15,000 a month in order to generate tens of thousands of leads. And I think Alex Jones, even after the cut down in his traffic, still is something like 700, 800,000 unique views on like a, a monthly basis to InfoWars. Mm -hmm. So he, it's possible he's getting a lot more than 15 grand a month since he seems to have the ability to drive a little bit more traffic. But it also seems unlikely that he's getting a whole lot more than that. And I, I know that in that there's a, a two hour interview Jones did drunk with uh, another David, uh, Bet David, <laughs> yeah. Robert or Patrick, Patrick, Bet David. David, the surprisingly good interviewer slash multi level know. marketing con man. <laughs> we were yeah. we were listening to that video just going like, what the shit? How is this the best interview that Alex the best interview for Alex was was this guy actually pushing back just like Alex. Alex. Yeah. Really have you considered that maybe some of this is your fault. Really held his feet to the fire on some things. I know. Yeah. yeah. Shocking. Pretty impressive. Yeah. And in that interview, Jones claimed that he'd lost about ten million dollars in ad deals in the first month of Trump's presidency. I will um, say that that number is slightly higher than what he cited at the time, but he is he has a habit of like I said, he's yeah. bad with numbers. But he also mythologizes himself quite a bit. So by this point, him expanding it to $10 million makes a whole lot of sense. But I think it was only like a couple million yeah. back then. I yeah. think he's at least multiplied it by a few. I feel like that's every time he cites a number. When he cites that same thing in the future, he'll double or so the number, like at least oh, a 40% yeah. increase. And, you know, that's cumulative over time. So I'm sure he'll be 30 or 40 million down, you know, in a year from now. Um, well, you might actually be 40 million down <laughs> well, yeah, from yeah. now. So that is what I want to get into because, um, yeah, the New York Times noted, uh, and this was like a September 13th or 14th report, that uh, InfoWars had a daily average of about 1.4 million visits to its website before the August 6th bans, and that by September, mid-September, they were down by about half. So it seems like the bans cut their traffic in half, which is obviously going to cut his revenue in half. And while I doubt he lost $10 million in a month, it seems pretty probable that he did lose lose a lot of money uh, yeah, yeah. as a result of his his increased visibility and, and the deplatforming and whatnot. Sure. So I always find it interesting when he lies about something that he absolutely doesn't need to lie about. Mm -hmm. Like $2 million, if you lost $2 million in a month, that's still a shit ton of money. Yeah. But he has to say, oh, it's $10 million. Like, wh wh why? Know, There's like no a, need. It's like fish stories, man. You know, like uh, fish. Yeah, it's, still fish a, big. it's still a big ass fish. Yeah. yeah. Enjoy it. Yeah, it's like it's like I mean, it's he also has to kind of lie uh, uh, about his influence, even though there's plenty of things he has to legitimately claim like that he's influenced. I don't know. I, he he does seem to have like some sort of allergic prohibition of, against telling the truth. It's it's kind of weird. Um, 
But yeah, nobody uh, would ever elect a guy like that president. I'll no, tell you that. No, right no, now. no. He he would never get further than having a weird show on the radio. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, the, like it, it it's it definitely seems likely that this partnership with Jeunesse came out of a a severe cash crunch for Jones. Like that's the picture I'm getting as I look at this because we know his mm-hmm. ad revenues down. We know it seemed like if he's willing to give up Infowars life, it means those sales have probably fallen significantly. Well, um, I, I I think that your your thinking is probably pretty correct on that. But my my theory is that uh, Infowars Life was all done through his weird doctor friend, who's actually a chiropractor, Doctor right. Group. Yeah, Doctor it Group. It's it's all done through the uh, global healing center that Doctor Group runs. He has all his products, and then Alex makes a different name for them and sells them on Infowars Life. And my theory is basically once Alex got kicked off of everything, Doctor Group realized there's nothing in this for me anymore. So he wanted to stop his dual branding with Alex. So Alex probably didn't have as much of a choice as it appears with InfoWars Life going away because now he can't private label all this like super male vitality, anthroplex. All That's of his, uh, interesting. I, it- I noticed a, a decrease in appearances by Dr. Group, uh, especially in the last like nine months or so. Whereas he used to come on and do infomercials fairly yeah. regularly. Um it- so, I mean, that, that seems really consistent, though, with Alex Jones's character, because if Dr. Group has pulled away from Jones and isn't, you know, willing to work with him in the same extent that he used to be, it would mm-hmm. make sense that Jones is calling those supplements not as good as the ones like that he would be willing to throw not just Group, but the products under the bus, because that's j- oh, very much yeah. in Jones's character. It fits the pettiness that we've yeah. uh, we've seen uh, for a long time. And Alex's jumping from thing to thing is pretty consistent throughout his career. Yeah. Like, you, he used to be basically a gold salesman for Midas Resources. Uh, <sighs> Ted Anderson runs this gold company called Midas Resources yeah. that also owned Genesis Communications Network that would distribute Alex's show. In September of 2015, Ted lost his gold license. <laughs> and, so for totally non-criminal reasons, I don't know why that would be the first place your head jumps to. A guy just lost his gold bullion sales license. That's just normal shit that happens. He forgot to re-up with the government. Come on. Jordan is not correct on that. There were some shady dealings no, being done by Midas Resources. On. So he wasn't allowed to sell gold anymore. He And so he ended up becoming, actually, he sells like bulk beef now. And- <laughs> It's a very Midas Resource is a very strange place well, to get into now. But. I've always called beef red gold. I mean, that's just, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's the gold of your stomach. Yeah. So when when Ted lost his gold bouillon license, uh, Alex immediately, almost uh, like two weeks after that, I believe, did a money bomb, and it was just sort of out of nowhere. Also, right around the end of the fiscal year, when you got to get your taxes together. Sure. Uh, so he there's that confluence and a, a little bit. After that is when a lot of the uh, the supplement sales went into overdrive. Though he'd already started that end of the business a year prior, it wasn't pushed nearly as hard as it was uh, after uh, 2015 and onwards. So I, I've I've noticed a weird trend of him like sort of leapfrogging from cash cows, kind of. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah. And I I gotta say, just to to it's a little aside, but it's really. One of the things that's most frustrating to me about 2018 is like I spent like I'm going to guess you did as well. A lot of my late teen years and early 20s and like the weird conspiracy corners of the Internet. And I have fond memories of those days. Sure. And I yeah, have me fond, too. Yeah, I, I have really fond memories of using like weird libertarian gold e-currency to buy drugs off the Internet from Canada. And now that's all ruined because it's all turned into this like right wing, like this like funding machine for militias, basically. Like it's all it's just such a bummer. Like I want to think back fondly about using e-gold to buy 2CI, but it's just it's 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 been corrupted now by the nothing. Nothing gold can last, as they say. (laughs) Nothing e-gold can stay. (laughs) My my disappointment comes from uh, losing my favorite advertiser that he ever had, which was a diamond gusset jeans. Do you know diamond gusset jeans? I have heard diamond gusset jeans on y'all's show. The ads for them. Uh, incredible, <laughs> yeah. incredible songs. But my favorite part was when he was doing research into Diamond Gusset Jeans. He found all these reviews, and they were consistent in one thing, which is that whatever pant size you ordered, 
that would be the only pant size you did not receive. <laughs> it was pretty it random. It was a random pants generator, <laughs> and that makes me so happy uh, for some uh, like. Uh, uh, <laughs> Jordan, you need animalistic <laughs> reason. I need to you, never know what pant size I'm going to wear. But you don't need to worry about it because they're still a sponsor of the Genesis Communications Network. Oh, well, then see, there we go. That relationship Wait, is still, still in intact. business? Oh, yeah. Oh, they're still shit. around. Everybody loves American jeans. <laughs> <laughs> Diamond Gusset sc- subscriptions all around. I'm buying around for everybody who listens to this show. All right. I just I want to know where you have to be in your life that you buy pants through the radio. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that, a, a patriot. That's yeah. where you have to be. <laughs> okay. Um, so, <laughs> but driving us back to Jeunesse just a little bit, it does seem that there's some current desperation for steady monthly income in Alex Jones. I don't know, like you, you pointed out, he's leapfrogged from a lot of cash cows over the years, but it seems like now one of the things that's new is that he's willing to burn his audience to get it because Jeunesse is not a nice company, not that there are nice MLMs. But just this August, they settled a $2.5 million class action lawsuit, and the plaintiffs in that lawsuit alleged that Jeunesse was, quote, a misleading business opportunity disguised as a legitimate way to make money, which seems like a reckless thing for Jones to do with his audience, which has already dwindled as a result of everything that's happened. (laughs) The problem with that description of uh, Jeunesse to be in a lawsuit is like that's also a one way to describe capitalism right well <laughs> a yeah. misleading way to <laughs> I mean, well, that... it's one of those things like at the basic level like okay you work a job and use the money you get at that job that you're paid for your level to buy, labor to buy goods and services there are complaints you can have about that level of capitalism which is different than like an mlm where it's like no you yeah. buy a bunch of products and the whole goal is to trick you into thinking that this will make you rich but you never make a dime there's scams right. and then there's scams on scams. Yeah. The thing I, I would think about your your characterization of him being willing to like sort of take a risk with his audience like this, I don't think that that's out of character for him at all. Even on your episodes when you were going over his supplements, you guys talked about how <laughs> there was a bunch of lead. lead in it. <laughs> you're yeah. right. You're right. <laughs> and and a lot of the stuff that he sold were uh, were pretty bunk, even yeah. uh, without. The idea that there's heavy metals in them, you know, just the the actual thing isn't going to get the result that he is saying you probably will. So I think for years he's he's been perfectly willing to endanger people um, yeah. to, to make a bottom line. But it does seem like that's a little bit more of a subtle. Like for one thing, yeah. lead poisoning is just going to make you a better Infowars consumer. Uh, sure. <laughs> like it's it's not going to hurt your ability to enjoy Alex Jones's content. Oh um, hell yeah. <laughs> But, like, the supplement industry is gigantic, and 99% of it is a scam. Like, obviously, there's some vitamin supplements that can be useful, but, like, it's mostly bullshit. And that's My favorite are the uh, uh, paint chips. Have you ever eaten those? I didn't know that was uh, classified as a supplement. It's like they're kettle-cooked paint chips. Oh, yeah, you got the nice crunch. No, they're delicious. You get a... You get a little bit of brown on them, perfect. I like the jalapeno <laughs> paint chips. Those are my favorite. Weird fact about paint chips, less lead than Alex Jones's supplements. <laughs> <laughs> Deep earth iodine is made of lead. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I gotta I gotta tune us out for an ad break right now uh, for some some products and, uh, and you know services the the capitalism stuff that we're talking about, but not the MLM version of capitalism. The this is yep yep <laughs> we, we approve. That, that is, now that is an ad pivot, my friend. That is the way you do it. <laughs> and we're pivoted. And we're back. Uh, we're back, and we're talking about Alex Jones. Uh, and we are. I want to get into how Alex has chosen to brand Infowars. Yes, because it's really interesting to me. Are you, are you talking about the weird red lettering? No, that is very, uh, seems very off uh, off style for him. It all seems off style to him. Um, like you know, like Infowars life products use terms like shield, force, defense, and it was all very militarized. It looked yeah, almost yeah. like like most of the products in Info, on Infowars life looked like something you might pick up in like a first person shooter video game as a power up like for that's sure yeah. yeah 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 infowars yes looks like it's aimed at like middle-aged housewives uh not that that's a bad thing but like the picture of alex jones in the the infowars yes banner ad that i sent you guys he's mm-hmm. clean shaven it looks like it was taken about 15 years ago and the color tone is like a really light calming blue um and it, it's he's, not at he's all safe. yeah he's safe and healthy and young well, he went with Infowars, yes, because Infowars Tupperware was actually already taken. <laughs> well, did you guys know that Infowars, yes, is a is an acronym? 
Yeah, it's like <laughs> y- uh, youth enhancement system or something you like nailed that. It. You nailed it. I didn't know this. Yeah. How do you know this? Why didn't you tell me this? I know a lot of things. <laughs> about and Alex you only Jones. know a little bit. <laughs> <And> I- <laughs> So the youth enhancement system is the centerpiece of what Jeunesse claims to offer Alex's fans. And so there's a bunch of different products that you're supposed to take for all of the different ways that you can get younger if you take the drugs that Alex Jones wants to sell you from this company. And the most striking product that I found is the Finity pills, Mm. which... (laughs) (laughs) You'll die sometime, Finity. (laughs) It it seems, yeah, like the, the, the pictures on the pills are like young couples. They're doing everything they can in the brand to make it look like this will make you live longer without actually lying and say that this will extend your life because then the FDA will get on their asses. Sure. Um, sure. There's there's laws about certain claims. Yeah. Yeah. But you can call a thing finity. <laughs> well, finity and nowhere else is his well, rallying cry, I believe. I'm going to guess by the spelling that the only reason they didn't go with infinity is that that would have been like infringing on the, the cars. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. That is... As a copyright. Yeah. <laughs> he also has a brand of cars named Paula. Just uh, yeah, he stops there. The Paulas and and don't forget his undies. <laughs> <laughs> so I looked into the uh, the ingredients of the Finity pills because this seems to be the centerpiece of the strange life youth enhancement systems Alex Jones is trying to sell. Uh, it includes astragalus root extract, which is. Mm. Uh, Supposed to be good for your immune system and uh, particularly famous for your heart. It's like a Chinese medicinal herb, but there are, uh, quote, no high quality studies in people. So there's no evidence of any health benefits. It costs about $2.75 uh, an ounce. There's coenzyme Q10, which costs about $20 for 60 pills. There's fucoidin extract, which is seaweed extract, uh, a little less than 20 bucks for 60 pills. There's patero pure, which is an antioxidant found in blueberries, which mm. is slightly cheaper than those other two pills. And then, you know, like turmeric and a number of other very, very inexpensive herbs. You guys want to guess the total price for 60 capsules of uh, Affinity? How much does a house cost? (laughs) (laughs) We are all millennials. None of us know that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I'm going to put it just south of that. (laughs) It is $144.95 for 60 capsules. Uh, (laughs) Now, now... You're supposed to take two a day, so that is basically more than an average cell phone bill in order to get one set of the medications that they recommend you take with the uh, the YES program. So that's fun. But your um, phone doesn't make you young. Well, you no, know? it doesn't. No, it just gives you head cancer. So yes, that's yeah. right. That's right. <laughs> Throw your phone away by finity. Um, now you're getting it. Now your I should... phone doesn't make you young is my favorite song from the 70s. Yeah. Do you remember that one when it, it swept the swept the charts? Um. I should note for fairness that if you're a distributor, it's only $108 a bottle. Oh, so it's a, it's a steal. It's a steal. So that seems to be the angle Jones is going for here. And I do have a little bit of a conspiracy when it comes to the marketing of InfoWars Yes, because as I noted before, in all of the pictures of Alex on the InfoWars Yes site, he looks like about 10 to 15 years younger than he is. He's also clean mm-hmm. shaven and, uh, and really trim. So either the picture has been heavily airbrushed or they just picked a younger picture of Alex Jones. Or and both. I, or both. <laughs> or both, yeah. And I, I, I think this is done in order to create the illusion that Jones's wrinkled and careworn face has been de-aged by Janessa's remarkable products. And if that is the angle that they were going for, I have to imagine that Janessa was not happy to see Alex Jones give a two-hour interview to an MLM salesman named Patrick Bet David. Uh, mm-hmm. Because... <laughs> In that video, I included a, a, just a random screen grab from it that we'll also have up on the site. Alex Jones looks like he has aged about 20 years in the last six months. Like, <laughs> Oh, yeah. I, I don't like to critique people's appearance, but I believe on our show I said he looked like trash. Like yeah. He was slouched over and clearly drunk. It was a mess. He looks like a middle-aged man who has been drinking way too much. Uh, well, yeah. He looks like that that cartoon version of a hobo on the side of the street who sees a pink elephant walk by and then looks at his brown paper bag and like throws it in the garbage. Like it's yeah. His giant red nose is incredible. Yeah, except he'll <laughs> never throw away that bottle. <laughs> and I will say uh, one of the things That's that makes right. me... He's been, the best way to describe him is if that cartoon hobo saw all these pink elephants and was like, hell yeah, and just kept drinking out of that brown bag. <laughs> I love me an elephant. <laughs> yeah, pink elephants. Yep. It, one of the things that concerns me a little bit is that, you know, if you remember that wonderful forest bathing video Alex Jones oh, did. Yeah, yeah, right. That, uh... 
yeah. shirtless out out in the out in the woods. He looks for a guy in his forties, relatively fit in that video. He's certainly not massively overweight or anything like that. He doesn't look unhealthy. He looks like he has aged way more than two years in the time since that video was taken. Um, you, you know, you know how there are some people in the world who like you get them at the right angle and they kind of look great. Mm-hmm. You look at them a different angle, it's kind of like, oh boy. Yeah, I think Alex is very much like that. Like he has the kind of stocky body that if he sort of pulls it in a little bit, he doesn't look like if he has good posture and is trying to present himself, he looks bad but not terrible. But then if he's drunk talking to Patrick Bet David, <laughs> he looks like like a like a hobo. Yeah, basically. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he does look like a hobo. One of the things I noticed in that interview is that he claimed repeatedly that they've never had more hardcore listeners than they do right now after the purges. And that interview was posted the day after the New York Times posted that article about how their traffic's fallen by more than half, which is uh, just a fun little side side note here. <laughs> I do think probably the most interesting thing to me, because like obviously the uh, the thing that got the most coverage in that video was Alex saying he was ready to die repeatedly. Yeah, All um, right. oh, I'm ready. I'm ready to die. I'm ready. And to if die. my kids get, if my kids get, uh, they're gonna kill my kids. I think. Uh, <laughs> Anyways, I'm I'm a positive guy. What <laughs> What were we talking about? Major ma- ma- Major League Marketing. Is that what we're doing? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I will note that there is one moment in that whole interview where Alex seems to react with genuine horror and empathy, and it's when Patrick Beck David talks about the time that he lost his voice for 90 days. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. And Alex is, like, Alex's response is very genuine, and he seems horrified by the thought of not being able to talk, which... I, I, well, yes, but if you recall, he was drunk. He was and, drunk. And as Patrick is telling that story, Alex takes a big bite out of an apple yes. and says... Life is very fragile <laughs> with a mouthful of apple. Life's <laughs> very fragile. Yeah. So and we're going to. Less stoic than. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's kind of for me when I look at somebody like you. I lost my voice for 90 days four years ago. Okay. And if you're running a business and you're selling, you're speaking all the time. I mean, you that's was, not good. That's not good. Is I mean, you like a polyp on your I, They thought it was a cancer. I had to go. It was benign. They did a surgery. I lost my voice Thanksgiving. I couldn't talk for 90 days. Voice was gone. Jeez. I couldn't speak at all. And so for me, so that's a it genuine was a way reaction. for me to sit back and realize, you know, the smallest little thing is a big part of your life. So I felt like if I can't speak, Life's very fragile. right? <laughs> if I can't speak, what do I do? So today, if five billion. <laughs> a lot of wisdom there, Alex. <laughs> Never not the best. It's the perfect intersection of being rude and empathic at the same time. It's just, it's bizarre. No. Oh my God, that's awful that something happened to somebody who's not me. <laughs> Anyways, this apple is delicious. So there is a point in that interview where Alex gives, I think, what I think is a really insightful and accurate answer to a question. I don't think he means to. I think it's just part of his spiel, but I think it's one of those... It's like how he accidentally predicted 9-11 because he just has been predicting disaster every day for the last 12 years. There's a moment where Patrick Bet David asks him why the globalists just haven't had him murdered yet if he's such a threat to their schemes. Uh, And Alex notes, because they thought I was a joke, like a poison I titrated, and it's the way God works. It isn't me. And I I do think that's why none of the people politically who were harmed in a serious way by the uh, influence that Jones has gathered took him seriously until after the 2016 election, because we all just thought he was silly. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I agree. I agree with his uh, assessment pretty fully. But at the same time, it's interesting that like until very recently, his answer to why isn't he dead yet? was that he's too popular to kill. Yeah. So, like, it's interesting that he's even shifted that to a more introspective, uh, actual searching answer than just like, ah, I would be too much of a problem. Yeah. Where it's, it's like, <laughs> no, no, I was insidious. I uh, I flew under the radar as a goofy clown. Um, it's, it's also really interesting to me how his go-to description of himself is as a poison. That's just kind of fun. Uh, Especially for someone selling lead. (laughs) (laughs) Lead Lead-based pills. Um, So now I just listened to y'all's latest episode of Knowledge Fight, where you covered a a 2018 episode, and you revealed that Alex has... There's so many new schemes coming out of Alex Jones that it's hard to to keep track of them all. So I'm glad I listened to this one before this episode, because he is now getting into the meme-making business, which is... 
He's the mean machine. I, it, it's really, it seems like he's trying to brand himself as the news site of 4chan's poll board. Because, like, one of the things that I saw the last time I visited InfoWars, uh, if you're paying attention to the dark, gross, right wing corners of the internet, there's a meme, the NPC meme has, has gone yeah. viral recently, which is basically everyone who isn't a really far right wing shit poster is, a, is an inhuman thing incapable of independent thought. Uh, and so we describe them as a non player character. There were like five or six different articles on InfoWars that all included the term NPC when I visited well, that's, last. That's because this meme is going to change the world. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's big stuff. But it, it, Did it, you get one? Did, did, did anyone do that to you? What? Did anyone NPC you? Oh, oh no, you not yet. NPC? I have oh, not wow, yet. Okay. No, 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 no. Uh, I, I know that uh, Jared Holt got the, uh, the NPC treatment. Great. <laughs> yeah. I remember him posting something about that, and I thought, like, well, all right, he seems to be taking that in stride. No, I've gotten a number of, like, I, I was doing reporting on a 4chan's poll board back in, in 2016, and I got a number of death threats back then, uh, sure. but I haven't gotten, I don't know, maybe I have gotten an NPC meme. Nobody shared it with me on Twitter, and I rarely go to poll directly. Um, Smart. Yeah, Smart. yeah. But uh, it is interesting. Like he's he's announced that he's starting a whole new section of the site that's going to be focused mm-hmm. around memes, and he just announced just that, memes, just memes, just memes. Because what that's what it's what defeats the globalists. Totally, <laughs> they don't. They want you to use emojis. They yeah. want you to use emojis, when, Dan, uh, s- and that is what the globalists have always wanted. That that shit. Uh, emoji? That's nowhere near as good as the shit meme. So totally. it, it, explain the emoji thing, because I didn't even catch that on there. No so is, is that what he's saying? <laughs> well, no Ro- fucking clue! Robert, you, what you need to understand <laughs> is that the Fabian socialists, uh, <laughs> they are still actively involved <laughs> yep, in manipulating yep. the world. Uh, the Fabian socialists. And they want all of us to use emojis because they restrict language. Because that smiley face can only mean a smiley face. It just means oh. you're smiling. Whereas memes can mean anything. They have the, it, there's creativity within me. I don't know. That's basically what okay. he's trying to say. But I don't. I don't know if I believe it. I know I don't believe it. But yeah, that's, that's, his, that's his angle. He's trying to make. I think it's very thin. And also, I should say this: there's no way that part of the website is ever going to get made. He just. <laughs> That was Alex talking shit. That's not going to happen. <laughs> Do you think there's going to be a $10,000? Because he announced a $10,000 prize that he was <laughs> personally announced... going to give to the best meme. <laughs> he has announced so many multi-thousand so dollar prizes. No one, I think, has ever collected on <laughs> any one of those. That... There was that uh, that uh, whenever uh, uh, Kathy Griffin made that uh, distasteful picture with Trump's head. Alex yes, had... distasteful in heavy scare quotes. Yeah, Alex had uh, Mike Cernovich on, and they were going to start a contest where they were trying to get people to get homeless people to walk around with CNN is ISIS shirts. Oh, my God. Uh, and uh, somehow they would reward people for getting homeless people to be walking billboards. <laughs> I, that I was forgot a really... that the plan was to get homeless people to do it. Yeah. What kind of nonsense plan is that? It was it was pretty gross. It was pretty <laughs> gross to hear. But We're going to kill two birds with one stone. We're going to clothe the homeless. And we're going to take Hillary down. That makes perfect sense. That literally was their angle. <laughs> it, yeah. And so they, they do this all the time. They come up with these weird uh, ruses and uh, media stunts, and almost never are uh, they followed through with, except for the uh, Bill Clinton is a rapist one. That's the yeah. that's the only one that really people followed through with, and apparently Alex did pay people for that. So I do want to ask you, uh, Jordan, in particular, like uh, one of the things y'all have been doing on your show that I think is really interesting is trying to trace back the origins of, uh, like nowadays pretty much constantly Alex Jones is mentions George Soros. He's like the big boogeyman on Infowars, and that has not always been the case. Uh, and I think you'll you'll document that somewhere around 2009, 2010 is when he first started talking about Soros. But even then, he was mentioning that the guy was really low on the totem pole. The the first time that we've heard, I mean, uh, obviously he's been doing the show for blah, 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 yes, whatever amount the 90s, of years. Yeah. But the first time that we've heard of Soros, because Dan has been conducting a, uh, a an insanely thorough investigation of 2009, which the ostensible point is to figure out when he joins up with the Tea Party, and we're three months past when the Tea Party started, and we've all all we've heard is nonsense. Yeah. Uh, so we finally hear from one of his uh, callers, I believe, like. Hey, you hear about that Soros cat? And Alex is like, yeah, Soros is bad. Moving on and never speaking of this again. That was it. (laughs) And then later on in 2018, he's claiming that he's known about Soros since the 80s when PBS used to run a a week-long documentary series 
about how Soros is the most evil human being that there's ever been. Yeah, his, his story has changed considerably. Yeah. It, in 2009, the best I can tell, at least at the point that, that we've been looking into it, the only thing that he ever has mentioned Soros about is there was a clip that came out uh, of George Soros talking at uh, the Davos meeting. And uh, he mentioned the ramifications of the dropping price of oil that we experienced back then. And he was talking about how uh, one of the after effects you're going to see is that a lot of the countries uh, that uh, support rogue activity around the globe that are funded by oil interests, and he names a number of countries, and notably points out Russia uh, as being one of them, those countries have uh, limited resources to use because they're not making as much as they used to uh, uh, after the oil price has gone down. And Alex says... George Soros is admitting that he crashed oil in order to punish these countries, which doesn't reflect the clip at all, but he doesn't really talk much about it at all. It's just sort of like a little piece he throws in and then doesn't mention him at all. And then we flashed forward to November 2010 when Glenn Beck did his, uh, his disgraceful George Soros puppet master report on Fox News. And what we found was Alex's response was, this is laughable. You think George Soros is a big deal. He's middle management, basically. He's like, he doesn't matter. George Soros doesn't make decisions. He's, he's a hanger on with the, uh, the globalists. And so to, to short version, I guess, is we don't really know at this point exactly when he starts turning him into the demonic uh, head of uh, his enemy team, but it definitely has not been consistent. See, and that's really, because in, in that old stuff, like one of the things I know he mentioned when he was talking about Soros is that he was part of the, the left wing of the buzzard or whatever that is the, the globalist conspiracy to destroy all freedom and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And that's the most interesting thing to me about Alex's evolution over time is how he went from this guy who was like the left and the right are both equally full of shit and they're, they're both equally bad and part of this giant conspiracy and... You know, the real important thing is, you know, freeing yourself from the new world order. And he has completely gotten off that train now, it seems like. Like, he's not, uh, I mean, I guess he probably still does use the new world order phrasing, but yeah. he's become a completely partisan creature now, which is almost like kind of a heartbreaking journey for him. Because I. Mm, uh, it appears to be heartbreaking, but I think that the reality is that. One thing that we didn't expect when we started looking back through time is that if you look at what what's motivating him even behind the right left paradigm being an illusion and stuff like that is that like the reason that they're both bad is that they both want to infringe on whiteness. There is a consistent white identity defensiveness that characterizes Alex throughout all of his career that I'm able to to look into. And so my feeling on him formerly being like the right and the left both suck and now him being super conservative is more a reflection of how far the right has gone down towards what he's into which is defending guns vociferously and being super into straight white male christian identity so i think i think that he was waiting for a team to emerge that he could be a part of and there wasn't a team there was just basically right. ron paul that was someone he could be like that guy's good no before we started doing this this show the you know I, all i knew about alex jones was essentially like hey here's this crazy guy who spouts conspiracy theories on uh, on the radio and as we keep going back through different eras of this time the only thing that's consistent is white supremacy so whenever he's going back and saying like Oh, I hate George W. Bush. It's not about the right's policies in any way. It's about George W. Bush outwardly saying, like, maybe we should still make an inclusive world, even though he's not acting it. Yeah. But now that somebody is out and out saying, like, have you considered that being Nazi is great? He's <laughs> like, yes, I have considered that, and I agree. That actually makes him make a lot more sense, and I want to yeah. uh, I want to I want to move into. I know you guys have some clips that you have uh, you have curated, and I'm excited to talk about those. But before we treat our listeners to some more of the best of Alex Jones, uh, <laughs> it's time to <laughs> treat way. them to the best of some a ads.
Okay, we're back. We're talking about Alex Jones, and uh, Dan and Jordan have been doing this for years. You've listened to hundreds of episodes of Alex Jones, and you've come across some pretty objectively insane things that uh, a <laughs> casual Jones researcher like myself could never have hoped to find. So I'm just going to hand things over to you. So why don't you set up some of these clips for us and explain what sort of <laughs> bounty we have for our listeners today? Certainly. Uh, what is this, a crossover episode? <laughs> but, but before I get into this, I want to say I thought that your episodes were really uh, insightful and, and very on point. Um, but two things I wanted to point out were, one, um, when you mentioned the InfoWars Human Resource Director, <laughs> it's worth noting that that's Alex Jones's dad, <laughs> is their Human Resource Director. So that's one thing. He's very hands-on. Yeah. It's really a, this, <laughs> it's a natural <laughs> step from paying off the people that beat up your son to not complain that he's bled on their shirt <laughs> yeah, to yeah. directing HR for his company. <laughs> Yeah, Seems CIA like, dentist uh, Infowars HR. That makes perfect sense. It also implies he might be a little bit biased about harassment complaints when it's uh, my employee and uh, my son uh, <laughs> who is being complained about. And then the second thing was, uh, I believe in the first episode, it came up that Alex might be a DJ. Um, yeah. And this is a big misunderstanding. His cousin Buckley is a DJ. <laughs> and... Alex. The most important piece of information anyone needs to know about yes. InfoWars. Buckley, surprisingly, not a terrible DJ. He's, He's pretty not legit. terrible. He He's not a, terrible. He has a SoundCloud. It's Buckley <laughs> Hammon, H-A-M-M-A-N. And uh, it uh, it bangs. It's pretty good. He's uh, he's pretty talented. But I'm sorry. He's also noted multiple times on the uh, sexual harassment uh, complaints. Oh uh, yeah, he yeah. seems like a horrible person. Oh yeah, yeah. no, he's a monster. Decent DJ. Decent, <laughs> Decent DJ. DJ. Yeah. Um, Isn't that how it always goes though? So um, I guess the best place to start out would be um, one of the first things I wanted to learn about was what the path from Alex being this weirdo conspiracy guy to being Trump's propagandist. I wanted to uh, experience what that journey was like. So we went back and listened from the day that Trump announced his candidacy to the point where he says it's Trump or die. Um, and we experienced that ride. But one of the things that I'd never expected was when he announces his candidacy, Alex doesn't give a shit. He doesn't care at all. He doesn't even say anything about it on the day he announces but on July 3rd, 2015, he finally starts talking about Trump's candidacy, and he says this. You go and you show at, at the university four or five palace-sized houses, 40 million, 13 million, you name it. And you say, is this Donald Trump's? Everybody thinks he's the richest guy. The guy's literally nothing. Kind of just a front man for some consortiums on the East Coast. I'll leave it at that. Oh, yeah, Trump's piece of work, folks. <laughs> huh. <laughs> and they go in there. It's just mind-blowing. I don't even know what to say anymore. So his initial position on it is that Trump is a, he's mobbed up. He starts talking uh, pretty Which is consistent. accurate. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a rare, oh, absolutely. It seems like a rare instance it's where Alex of, has yeah, good information. It's one yeah. of the few times where it's like, Oh, yeah, no, no, you fucking nailed it. Yeah. And, of course, four months later, he's like, Trump is the best guy that's ever existed. Yeah. So, so you see him for a while being kind of, like, dismissive of the entire candidacy as Trump's rhetoric gets more towards what he likes to see in terms of being kind of cruel to uh, non-white Christian straight males. He's like, oh, this is interesting. And then as some of these influencers, Steve Pachanik, Roger Stone, um, I believe Eric Prince also, he, though he never shows up on the show, there's yeah. definitely indications Alex has made that he was one of his sources. And I, um, I, I do want to drill into that a little bit. The Eric Prince, Roger Stone, uh, Alex, like how Alex Jones ties into the Guccifer stuff, because that's something mm -hmm. I didn't get into at all because I wasn't really I didn't really know much about it until I listened to y'all talking about it. And that's can you break that down for me? I can try. It, it's going to involve a little bit of conjecture because okay. You, you kind of have to put together the pieces of stray things that uh, people have said on Alex's show. Roger Stone and Steve Pachenik, who's a former PSYOP expert for the State Department, who is now a uh, guy who's running PSYOPs on Alex on his broadcast, uh, the two of them have multiple times on the show referenced something that they call the group or the 45 group and talked about how they got together and put plans uh, in motion in order to get Trump into office. 
I don't know for sure, but it appears based on the rhetoric that Steve Pachanik has said on the show that Eric Prince may or may not be a part of that group as well or in some way working with them. Because one of Alex's big things was this idea of there was a soft coup going on within the government against Hillary Clinton. And his belief about it is, is basically that there are forces within the military that were working with Russia and Assad in order to crush ISIS, and they did this behind the back of Obama. And when you really sort through the muck and you see like what comes through the sifter, it appears that probably Eric Prince, as a guy who runs a mercenary organization, may have made a deal uh, with Russia in some way. And this is what's being translated to Alex as our military made a deal uh, in order to fight ISIS. That's so, so fucking crazy. <laughs> I believe a lot of this information that clearly relates to Eric Prince is being filtered through Steve Pachanik and being translated onto Alex's broadcast as the idea that there are patriots within uh, these communities that are fighting back against the globalist Hillary Clinton forces. And so that makes him think that he has uh, like real legitimate backing within the government when it appears that that well unfortunately now is the case yeah yeah well, so the most fun thing about roger stone calling something the group of mm -hmm. 45 is that you you can place that within such a wide spectrum it could literally be a facebook group chat could be or it could be an eyes wide shut orgy and there's it could be anywhere in between roger stone is that guy oh of like it could be so boring, or it could be the weirdest sex party. Because I have no idea. I, I can't believe that Alex Jones has not been to a party that was shot for shot indistinguishable from the one in Eyes Wide Shut. Oh, absolutely. Um, like, that's his Thursday. Uh, he, <laughs> he's just that kind of guy. Um, I hung out with Charlie Sheen during his most wild times and uh, is now good friends with Roger Stone. Seems, I mean, it's, I don't think that Alex doesn't like to party. Two guys yeah. notorious for not having any sexually transmitted infections <laughs> at all. <laughs> so with, uh, like, it, it seems like uh, Jones was essentially used as like the dissemination point for some of this hacked information that like Roger Stone may have been a broker from. Like that's kind of the, the rough picture you can put together. It appears so. Yeah. And it, in Roger Stone's case specifically, we went back to the day uh, that uh, when when all that information came out about Roger Stone's contacts with Guccifer 2.0, uh, we went back to, I believe it was August 16th, 2016. That's, yeah, that seems yeah, yeah. right. Roger Stone calls it the day the music died, I believe. Yeah, <laughs> we went back to that day and we found Alex teasing uh, secret information that and it, it ends up being what WikiLeaks puts out. So there, there is an indication that he has got contact from Roger Stone, that Roger has made contact with this other source. And mysteriously, even before the YouTube channel was taken down, that episode is one of the only ones that wasn't available on his YouTube channel. That day had been taken down uh, or hidden somehow. But generally, I used to be able to find all of his episodes just easily on YouTube. And that one I actually had to dig for. That's really interesting. It's um, suspicious. It yeah. doesn't prove anything, but it's suspicious. No, and it's a more believable conspiracy than anything I've heard from Alex Jones in quite a while. Uh, <laughs> and I, I should say that it does sound conspiratorial to say, like, there's this group or, yeah. or, or what have you. And I wouldn't feel comfortable saying it if it weren't something that was brought up by multiple guests of Alex Jones's show that publicly pretend they don't know each other. So it, it seems incongruous that Steve Pachanik and Roger Stone would both be on the show and before that point be very clearly saying that they don't know each other and referencing the same group of people who are pushing behind the scenes for Trump to be president. Best argument against that, though, is if it is an eyes wide shut orgy, Can't everybody's wearing it. masks. That's true. Yeah. Everybody's wearing masks. You don't know. Could just be yeah. a plague doctor. Steve, yeah. Pach Steve Pachinik could have been inside Roger Stone and neither of them Absolutely. know. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You never know. <laughs> Sometimes you're uh, running a political campaign. Sometimes you're a fucking a PSYOPs director. It all happens. I thought yeah. you were going to say running a train on a PSYOPs director. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you want to set up the next clip? Uh, yeah. Sure. What's sure. this one? This one, uh, the clip title is uh, August 21st, 2018, Alex Sort of Confesses to Murder. 
<laughs> this is uh, one of the weirdest clips that we've ever encountered on the show, and uh, it uh, is in the middle of an episode that has nothing to do uh, with this sort of uh, topic, but Alex confesses uh, uh, he might have been involved in a crime. Google would love to have me arrested and killed, guaranteed. See, I've never killed anybody. Technically, one guy. Sorry, well, had some health problems later, but technically, I didn't. The point is, I've never killed anybody. And but these people have helped China kill millions. I will um, never not. <laughs> now, I've never killed a guy. Well, maybe one. Never, guy. Wait, 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 what? What? Do we get any more detail out of that? Because I have no, no trouble believing Alex Jones killed a guy. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Uh, a number of our listeners have uh, speculated that what he's referring to is like he's talked about like it, as a younger man bashing someone's head into the concrete. And then like you, you even mentioned uh, the you put a guy into a coma. And there's a decent chance that maybe that person died later of medical complications. And Alex considers that to be like oh, i kind of killed that guy wait he put a That's... guy into a coma did i mention yeah that? when you i I, I thought you did he... uh well his, his dad paid off uh some people uh one of them was uh, a guy that alex put into a coma oh no i was talking about the uh there was a police report from like a oh, fight you're talking he about, like, had what's that you're talking about space hitler yeah space hitler the fight with space hitler uh because <laughs> yeah, it doesn't yeah. seem like anyone got really hurt with that i had no idea he put a guy in a coma uh there's another story that alex tells about uh he presents it as he was being bullied uh, and picked on, and then the bully didn't realize that he could go, and so he didn't. He couldn't stop himself when the rage got in him. Oh. He was bashing his head into the concrete and put him into a coma. And his dad ended up uh, getting sued because that uh, guy's dad uh, sued him. But it appears that it would be when he was a juvenile, so it wouldn't uh, appear in like open records or anything yeah. if they. Because I found but, no evidence of that in any of the, and he, people have dug pretty deep into his into his background. But um, mm. man, that would be a you know, it's it's fascinating that a lot of the times the best way to dig deep into Alex's background is to just let him talk. <laughs> like doing a lot of research can sometimes hurt you, mm. other than corroborating the dumb shit that he said. Like because one of the, the and that's one of the most fascinating parts about studying Alex Jones is unlike a uh, uh, Tucker Carlson or a uh, Sean Hannity Alex says the quiet parts loud yeah. so much he's the weakest link of the right wing propaganda machine so anytime you want to find out what the real goal behind propaganda is just listen to Alex giving a side like Oh, and the, uh, Hillary's trying to kill everybody. The reason that I'm saying this is because, and then he just fills in the blank for you. Like, it's yeah. fascinating. He has very little filter, and uh, he's frequently drunk on air. So well, yeah, that that's, help. that's part of why he's worth covering to me. Because, like, one of the things, when I, when I did Alex Jones, a bunch of people, on uh, fans on Twitter asked about, like, when am I going to cover uh, Ben Shapiro or, or Charlie Kirk or those guys? And the answer is never, because the only people I want to focus on on this show are, they're all terrible, but there's something impressive about all of them. They've all, yeah, yeah. Yes. Like, do, like, and Alex Jones is an impressive human being. He is a person totally. who has accomplished things that have altered the world. Ben Shapiro is like a, a cheap Xerox copy of Alex Jones. Like, he doesn't have the courage to be as crazy or racist or violent as Alex Jones, but he still sells supplements. Like, he's just a ripoff. And yeah. like, yeah, there's no point in covering the ripoff. Let's talk about the real fucking thing. I, I agree entirely. I mean, there was something I was thinking about, uh, like in terms of our own show, because we we like to try and uh, not just talk about Alex Jones. We like to try and cover some other things, and people like Charlie Kirk or Ben Shapiro, even or a lot of these guys. They're just as dangerous in many yeah. ways, but their beliefs all still boil down to a lot of this idea of cultural Marxism, the globalist. All of their beliefs are tied up in the very same things that Alex has been covering for 20 years so they are clearly inspired by alex and they're just so much less fun yeah ben shapiro sucks to listen to he's the worst yeah he's yeah. even worse than listening to paul joseph watson and that is oh, a, that is a bar a, so low it's a floor yeah right yeah, yeah. yeah. insane it sucks how much to how do these guys do it <laughs> I, I don't know i don't understand i mean yeah it's 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 you know what? Let's let's wash the taste of thinking about Paul Joseph Watson out of our heads with another beautiful Absolutely. Alex Jones clip. You want to set this one up? <laughs> yeah, this one is uh, now. That's a good transition, my friend. <laughs> we have one, one per episode. <laughs> <laughs>
This one is called Alex is Freaked Out by American Muslims. And I believe that this um, sort of represents... You were mentioning that he's kind of a racist, bigoty kind of guy. Kind of. And I, I, kind of a little bit. Uh, and I think that this demonstrates his uh, just sort of baseline position about people that are different than him. Detroit school to hold Muslim girls only prom. Let me tell you something. He didn't... Uh... Hundreds of thousands Obama brought in. Everywhere I went in Austin yesterday, including a suburb, I went in two shops, a Starbucks, and then I went to Pool Supply place. And there were like seven people in the Starbucks. Three of them were young Muslim girls with hoods over their heads drinking coffee after school. Then I went to Pool Supply place, same deal. And all I'm telling you is, Imagine if you were in Saudi Arabia, and in Saudi Arabia they were walking to stores, and there were Christians and women with lipstick on and high heels everywhere. They'd start physically attacking you. But here we're tolerant. So I'm just saying we're letting in people in mass that are not tolerant, that are the most oppressive, cult-like people on earth, and it freaks me out. You bet I'm freaked out. You bet I am. So what's freaking him out is... Muslim girls, yeah, just, yeah, just yeah. teenage teenage girls, just at a pool supply. I and the the way he describes it, I I forgot completely that he describes them as Muslim girls in hoods, mm -hmm. like not not Muslim girls wearing a hijab or mm -hmm. or Burger, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a, anything. Just like they're wearing hoods, like yeah. they might even have been wearing a hoodie. Yeah, they might like, have just know? been girls wearing hoodies. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's it's yeah. really, and this is like a, a another a, one of those far right sort of Islamophobic things that frustrates me is like, yeah, Saudi Arabia is a garbage country with garbage laws. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in the Muslim world doing things that Muslims shouldn't do, like being very, very drunk. And usually the people serving me would be observant Muslims. And they're always just so happy to get you what oh, you want four screwdrivers. I'm just so happy to be able to like treat you as my guest right now. I just let, let me let me keep pouring this for you. Like it, I've never encountered any. uh <laughs> Like not that it doesn't happen in parts of the country, but like in or in parts of the the Arab world, but like as a general rule, I've encountered in my life in the South more Christians who would judge me for not looking like them than Muslims who would judge me for doing something that is forbidden in their faith. <laughs> totally, yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly what I've uh, heard from other folks uh, who had similar experiences. Yeah. I, uh, I have not uh, done too much traveling myself, but that's what I hear. It's I, never a bad idea to point out that people are not their governments. Yeah, people yeah. are not their government's policies. People are, uh, by and large, good. Yeah. People, people are don't just usually give a good. Shit what other people are yeah. doing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got my own shit to worry about. What about? Oh, you're drinking. My yeah. daughter is dating a rocker. Like, <laughs> oh, fine, sure. Yeah, a Saudi Arabian punk rocker. You yeah. know the band. Oh yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah. But, but in that clip, the thing that I think it really w is what drives it home for me and is the most re the reason why I generally choose this to be indicative of Alex's bigotry. Well, he said a lot of other maybe much more offensively bigoted things. This one is he's complaining about the idea that Muslims are coming to America and that they're awful or scary to him in some way. And then he goes on to describe what could be Muslim women doing very american things yeah he's integrating about, exactly <laughs> he's talking about people who are uh ab absorbing our way of life going to a starbucks uh going to a pool supply shop and that freaks him out he's freaked out by the idea of assimilation not the idea of non-assimilation and i think that's a general truth whenever these people talk about how when it, whenever they frame it as like my issue is that these people coming to the country won't assimilate no your issue is that they will they will become yep. part of the fabric of this country and both they and the country will change as a result because that's how the world works and that's what fucking terrifies you and exactly. your straight white identity won't have as much purchase as yeah. it used to you won't have the security of power that you once enjoyed and it's a classic example of him invalidating his own argument with the sentence that's supposed to validate his argument <laughs> like when he says you know if you go to saudi arabia and you wear lipstick they'll they'll physically attack you but here we're tolerant and you're like no you just literally said that you didn't want muslim girls in a pool supply store <laughs> yeah. what are you talking about we're tolerant well, there's here? nothing you're not 
there's nothing more sacred to an American than a pool supply store. Uh, that actually, you know, the, you, I yeah. really there's something that just makes me tear up with patriotic uh, vigor when <laughs> I see a bottle of muriatic acid. That really, whew, just shivers. That and the sunken of, living uh, room <laughs> are the only two things that I think America stands for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I want to hear the rest of your clips, but uh, I, this has gone on long enough that we're going to do a uh, an ad pivot, uh, okay. which I, I just announced, and you shouldn't, but uh, <laughs> buy these products. And we're back. This, uh, this clip here is, uh, Alex likes to talk about uh, how everyone accuses him of being uh, a Russian agent. He... he he complains about that all the time. He uh, says it's very unfair. It's a terrible criticism of him. One of the things that we found when we were looking over the 2015 turning into uh, being Trump's mouthpiece, we found that he was super into Putin before he was into Trump. Even as he's saying Trump is a, a mob boss, basically, he's articulating things along the lines of uh, Putin is a, uh, like he represents hope uh, for the world and that sort of thing. It's very Russian positive. So, uh, w- would you say that Vladimir Putin was like his gateway autocrat? I think he, I think he might have been. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure of any others that I can think of that he sort of full throatedly approved of before then. But he he's very much into Russia and Russia's line of propaganda in the world even before he gets in with Trump. And so in October 2015, we found this clip uh, that is really upsetting uh, if you consider, um, you know, now him saying, I, you know, I have nothing to do with Russia. Uh, This clip is October 2015. Alex is debriefed. I mean, we have the big listeners. And yes, the Russian government listens to the show. Then I was told that by RT International, one of their main heads, I'll leave it at that, in a Skype interview where I was told it was a Skype interview, and it wasn't a Skype interview. Once they cut to me, they started interrogating me in a big table with a bunch of top Russians at it asking me questions. And then they had been threatened to never have me back on RT by the U.S. government. They were basically asking me who I was, who I worked for, how I could do certain things. And they, they were asking me if I was a U.S. government agent or who I worked for. And I said, I work for Liberty. But that's the level I'm at where, like a James Bond movie, it's not RT. It's a big table in a government building with a bunch of guys staring at me. And I see them on TV sometimes, and it's like Russian, you know, <laughs> leaders. Uh, Putin listens to the show is the point. That's the point. <laughs> I am I am sure that Vladimir Putin in between. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm certain he's well, listening to four-hour InfoWars episodes in his busy days. It's a birthday thing. Like on his birthday, somebody murders a journalist, yeah. and he listens to Alex Jones. That's a, that's just a good day. Just kind of how he winds takes down. Takes a bath. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it's one of the skills that I think you can develop from listening to a ton of this stuff. Is sort of sussing out when Alex is lying and when he's not. Um, and there's little characteristic flourishes when he lies of like. He really overdoes some oh, of the, the details. The details get so. There were three globalists in mm-hmm. a hot tub. He's talking to three globalists. Two of them were wearing lovely suits in the hot tub. The other one was actually wearing a full suit in the hot tub. And then an info warrior comes in and joins the hot tub group. And mm-hmm. they're both sitting around the hot tub group. The info warrior says something and he goes, oh, I'm Alex Jones. And then the three globalists turn into demons and they fly away. Like that's that's how incredibly detailed his stories are whenever he's making shit up. Yeah, he gets really and, granular when he lies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so when, he, when I hear a story like that, um, I hear the, the ring of truth uh, to the, the sort of boringness of some of the details and, the, and the, the sort of concreteness of it. He goes in for an interview that he thinks is an interview. It's actually some Russian agents who want to talk to him about like, hey, you're saying a lot of stuff that we're into. Oh, also, let's flatter you and say that Vladimir Putin is a huge fan of your work. <laughs> and then he comes away from that being super in favor of Russia's angle in the world to the point where anytime there's uh, the world believes X, Russia believes Y, he believes Y. There's not necessarily it's not necessarily proof that like he works for them or anything like that. That would be crazy. But 
it is proof that I think he's been uh, compromised by flattery. I mean, we do know that there's only one, there's a, there's one degree of separation between Alex Jones and uh, Vladimir Putin, because uh, Alex Jones is friends with Steven Seagal, who's been on his oh, show, but Steven true. Seagal <laughs> is friends with Vladimir Putin. <laughs> so, or you could, uh, you could even go with Alexander Dugan. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, he, he's been on Alex's show multiple times, mm -hmm. and right after the election, Alex was on Alexander Dugan's show in Russia, where Alex almost cried. While Dugan told him that he was the model of an American man, and uh, he had single-handedly solved uh, American-Russian relations. Yeah, I believe Alex broke down in crying and then asked Alexander Dugan to be his head of HR. Yeah. Because his, his daddy issues are a little bit harsh. My dad's got to take a vacation. <laughs> so, uh, let's get to this mystery. Let's, uh, yes. let's, let's, let's crack this caper. Okay, so shall I play this clip and then you... Uh, you um, tell yeah, me what. Yeah, this is a, this is a clip that you guys put on your show pretty regularly when you announce your new uh, uh, Patreon backers and stuff, and it's uh, <laughs> it's never not hypnotized me into wanting to know what what the context is. So yeah, play the clip, and then uh, our our listeners will be curious too. I mentioned this on Saturday from the pulpit that someone someone sodomite sent me a bucket of poop. Did I tell y'all that? <laughs> and that's what's the name of that clip. That is, uh, Sodomite sent me a bucket of poop. <laughs> oh, okay, good. It's good. very self-explanatory, that. <laughs> so that uh, comes from uh, a sermon or a, a broadcast uh, that was made by a guy named Reverend James David Manning. Uh, oh, three names, be, perfect. <laughs> yeah, he used to be a regular guest on Alex's show um, and would come on and talk about how um, Starbucks was putting semen in people's lattes. Uh, there was all kinds of fun conspiracies. Now, is that extra? Because there's a couple grams of protein in that, and I can tell you, on a day when I'm really... No, okay, well, let's... <laughs> <laughs> it's a 479, I'll tell you that. I don't know why, but it's 479. He, uh, Manning would come on and, and engage in largely some pretty homophobic, Islamophobic uh, conspiracy theories. Um, and so he's talking about how, uh, you know, the gays are so out of control, one of them sent me a bucket of poop. Uh, and... Uh, I just thought that was pretty fun. <laughs> we did um, we did an episode about him being on Alex's show and how crazy it is that those worlds intersected. Um, and in doing that episode, we learned that uh, as soon as Trump got elected, uh, Reverend Manning decided this isn't the way to go. And he decided that Trump uh, was the devil. And uh, he now calls him Tribulation Trump okay. and refuses to go on Alex's show ever again. It's not bad. You know, there's, bad. That, that's actually a really satisfying arc. Uh, yeah. And kudos to that guy for not, like, like <laughs> Alex Jones has been inconsistent to a degree because, like, you know, he's always been the, he, he's just the whole the thing that he's supporting the greatest authority in the land now is very much counter to, th th at least this guy's consistent, you know? That's good. Yeah. I, I yeah. respect that. Tip of the hat to the reverend. Tip of the hat to the reverend. Uh, any sodomites listening, if you want to send this guy a bucket of poop, uh, it seems like... You can find his address. <laughs> you just Google Atla Ministries. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, I think that's going to be our episode for the day. I am uh, very grateful to you for putting those clips together and to, to both of y'all for sharing your uh, encyclopedic and somewhat frightening knowledge of Alex Jones. I do want to kind of close by asking... Are y'all worried about him? Because I'm a little worried about him, about his like, <laughs> mental and physical health. I'm worried for his kids. I'm yeah, not worried at, for him. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's sort of where I land on it. Like, if he flames out and self destructs, I'm not really concerned about that. But if, you know, if he hurts other people on the way down, then that's kind of. I am worried about that. It looks like he could uh, end up really screwing up some people's lives i i feel like uh the same feeling that you get when you start reading a serial killer's backstory where you read about the serial killer who killed like eight people and you're like oh this guy's a monster and then you find out oh he was horribly sexually abused as a child yeah. and all of this this just mountainous ride of bullshit happened to him and then you kind of start to empathize with this monster so the more time we spend with alex jones the more you find out that this is most likely a guy who has uh, malignant narcissism with uh, most likely a, a, a certain amount of schizophrenia built around it. And unfortunately was introduced to like John Birch Society ideas at a young age and didn't really understand what he was reading. And that's Ex shaped him 
um, as a political actor. Exactly. So, yeah. as, so as somebody who has been like, I'm, I'm bipolar type one, you know, and there's always an instinct that I have to empathize with somebody who is struggling with something that, uh, a, you know, sucks. Quote unquote, normal yeah. people don't have to deal with. And at the same time, you know, not everybody with a shit with a shitty childhood becomes a serial killer. So fuck that guy, you know. Yeah, I mean, because you got like the 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 Chobani guy who sued Alex and then kindly chose not to take control of Infowars. Essentially, like that guy was a refugee. That guy grew up with some probably a way more difficult childhood than Alex Jones. But rather than turning sure. into a, a a red anger goblin, became a philanthropist who helps refugees. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. I'm staunchly anti billionaire to the point of like we need to start sending Jeff Bezos buckets of poop. Mm-hmm. But Hamdi Ulakaya, he's not a bad guy. If someone's going to have, like, I, I would prefer we live in a world where nobody accumulate quite that much wealth, but he seems to be one of the ones who's been the most responsible with it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, yeah. Think, I think when you focus on helping other people and inclusion and that sort of thing, it sort of helps your soul. Whereas when you're really obsessed with exclusion in the way that Alex Jones is, it erodes you no matter what like no matter how much money you make no matter how much fame and acclaim you get it, it it'll just erode you and i think that's the difference between him and someone like hamdi and I, I think that's a great note to close out on so do you guys want to plug your pluggables uh before sure. we before we roll on yeah absolutely we like you uh, said uh, our website is knowledgefight.com we have some stuff up there probably more resources coming in the near future of uh of things um, we're on iTunes. We are. I am a, 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 a I don't know, semi a professional stand up comedian. Sure. You could probably find me somewhere, I suppose, <laughs> if you're going around. If you're interested in finding comics, you, you might stumble upon me. That's my plug. Okay. That's a good plug. <laughs> That's a good plug. <laughs> Thanks so much for having us. I really yes, appreciate it. Thank it's you great very to talk much. To you. Thank you guys yeah. for being on. Uh, listeners, again, knowledgefight.com. If you you want more Alex Jones, and I know you do, because the three episodes we already did on him were wildly popular. So check out their podcast. Listen to it. You can start from the beginning. You can listen to the more recent stuff. It's all just wild. And you guys make the soul-crushing experience of listening to Alex Jones enjoyable, because you portion it out in the right amounts to where it just doesn't <laughs> crush your spirit. Um <laughs> So thank you for what you do. Listeners, check out knowledgefight.com. I'm Robert Evans. This is Behind the Bastards. You can find us on behindthebastards.com, where we'll have some images from the show. You can find uh, us on Twitter and Instagram at BastardsPod. So yeah, check out Knowledge Fight. Continue checking out Behind the Bastards. And uh, thanks a lot for uh, being on today, guys. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>